To say that Pagan Valley loves analog horror is an understatement. Hell, just look at the last few months of content on this channel. But I don't think I have ever explained how I first got interested in the genre. I figured most people assumed Gemini Home Entertainment was the first one I had ever watched, which isn't true. I've been watching this genre unfold all the way before Local 58 posted their first video. Now this genre sits at the pinnacle of YouTube horror, which makes sense considering the type of media. But like I said, it wasn't those groundbreaking super popular series that first introduced me to analog horror. No, tonight we'll be looking at a channel I've been following for a long time before starting Pagan Valley. One that was in front of this analog horror craze before other more popular creators had even begun and a series that, undeservedly, is smaller than you would think. I am of course talking about the channel Alex Kansas. The channel is home to a young independent filmmaker and his various works of art. However, most of those older short films have since been removed from his channel, likely since he recently grew from around 7,000 subscribers to 62,000 subscribers. People were interested in the story Alex had created, not as much the small films. Which is kind of unfair, but when you get that big, you gotta start treating YouTube as a business. But the current catalog of these small analog horror videos is at 24, and as I would like to talk about each one of them, I want to spend these next two analysis videos highlighting 10 of what I think is the best of the channel, and coming up with what I think is happening in the world of Alex Kansas. In this video, we'll cover the first five of these videos, then in the next video, we'll wrap up the last five. But let me warn you, this is a very messy and confusing series of events you are about to witness. So if something doesn't make sense, don't blame me, because there is a lot that happens in these 10 videos. But before we begin, I just want to take a second to remind you that Pagan Valley is still growing, and I invite you all to like this video and subscribe to the channel to help support our content. With that, let's dive into the mysterious and strange world of Alex Kansas. I had thought that the best place to introduce all of you to this type of video series would be the video Liberty Looker. It begins with a brief intro telling us that we are listening to recovered audio from the designer of the Statue of Liberty. Let's take a listen. We are then told that Lady Liberty was then renovated in 1949, and the project was titled STLI 1.8084 and had been classified for 36 years. We are then shown a drawn diagram of the mechanism the government had installed under the Statue of Liberty. However, the machinery inside doesn't seem to have an obvious purpose. Until our presentation tells us this fact. During the summer of 1954, thousands of immigrants described a foul odor while passing through Ellis Island. We are then treated to a recording from one of those immigrants. <laughs> che volessero tornare a Milano per via dell'odore. La mia famiglia aveva spruzzato profumo e acceso candele per tenere lontano il fetore, ma funzionava solo per un'ora o giù di lì, finché l'aria diventava di nuovo insopportabile. Le serate 
erano così calde, rimasi per lo più sveglia, anche se il resto della mia famiglia dormiva profondamente. Ricordo che guardavo fuori dalla finestra ogni notte e vedevo file di persone che venivano condotte alla statua della libertà dai funzionari. Se solo fossero saliti sul piedistallo, i funzionari se ne sarebbero andati e non sarebbe successo nient'altro. La mattina seguente però ci sarebbe stata una vera peggiore, come un mattatoio. That the Ellis Island Immigrant Station was closed that November. But in August 1985, someone recorded what the public had called the Liberty Looker. Let's take a look at it. Without any doubt, whatever we saw start to climb out of the Statue of Liberty is definitely responsible for this mass grave investigators described the Statue of Liberty's interior. Our video then ends with a warning that we could be awarded compensation if our loved ones were taken at Ellis Island. So a few things to note so the next video will not seem too confusing. The use of monuments and statues and landmarks is an important element to this series, so most of our videos will surround something of that sort. However, those statues and such are meant to represent history, and as we push on, we'll soon find out that this world's history is not like ours, as things become... stranger. Our next video is titled Alcatraz Attacks, and begins with some footage of Alcatraz before something called therapy will be done to it. Our video then moves to a diagram of the island, where a few uncharacteristic factors stand out, such as a stockade, a detector room, ruins with a question mark, and some drawing of what looks like parts of a living cell. Our video then cuts back saying there is only one day left before therapy. Then the video introduces us to a term called alcatrazosis. The diagram then demonstrates how some sort of virus is spreading and multiplying using the prison going across the entire island. We are then shown the first therapy session over all of Alcatraz. Afterwards, we are told that there will be a projected movement, which is shown in the following diagrams. Whatever is on Alcatraz doesn't want to stay there, as it slowly heads to the mainland of California. Then our video begins to end with live footage of the island moving itself towards the mainland immediately after the radiation therapy. And again, we are shown that this is not the history of our world or reality, as according to our presentation, this alcatrazosis has spread all the way to Texas by 2020. But what is this disease, and does it have anything to do with the monster inside Lady Liberty? And why does the government seem to not really be concerned with these entities, instead opting to make documentaries about them like these two we just watched? Well, in the next video, we're going to get a quick history lesson from Alex Kansas on how different this world is from our own. Our next video is titled Dean Democracy and begins like a historical documentary on America's 37th president. Our narrator introduces us to a series of events leading up to the 37th presidential election. Forward to next week for a special broadcast of national significance.
Jennings would continue to remind viewers of this special broadcast over the next seven nights, even referring to it at one point as the most unprecedented announcement in recent history. A week after its first mention, Jennings reminded viewers of the special broadcast one last time, asking them to pay attention later that night for an exclusive look at the greatest gift to the American people. Due to the anticipation build over the week, over 60 million Americans tuned into ABC, waiting for the evening news to end and for the special broadcast to begin. There were countless theories as to what would occur, from the announcement of alien life to the declaration of an all-out nuclear war, speculation was brewing intensely. Once the evening news program ended, a black screen with a 10-second countdown commenced with the title Dean Democracy. Some viewers, so terrified of the threat of nuclear war, reportedly experienced nervous breakdowns and ran down the street declaring that Dean Democracy was the code name for an all-out nuclear holocaust. Yet once the countdown ended, all fears were soon replaced with tears of joy and an excitement not seen since the end of World War II. What are we waiting for? Let's bring them back home! In the seconds following James Dean's presidential announcement, hundreds of thousands of neighborhoods erupted into celebration. Although other candidates had promised to end the Vietnam War, none had so accurately expressed the same anger that they had felt, which Dean had perfectly conveyed in a 15-second broadcast. Due to popular demand, the ABC Evening News was cancelled the next night, replaced by a 30-minute loop of James Dean's presidential announcement. The broadcast was watched again by over 38 million Americans, and the parties continued for the rest of the week. Let's pause for one second. Obviously, James Dean didn't actually run for president in our world, but this is what I love about this series. Even though it seems ridiculous, the writing and editing of these videos can make the historical inaccuracies seem, well, real. Like we are looking from a window to a whole parallel reality where just minor things are changed. Let's keep listening. Due to repeated assassination attempts on Robert Kennedy, the Democratic Party presidential debates were cancelled for the 1968 election season. However, this proved to be no issue for Dean, as polls indicated that he was in the lead for the entirety of 1967 and 1968, despite having had fewer public appearances and rallies than any other candidate. The strength of his campaign relied on the powerful advertisements he directed that would air every Friday evening on ABC. The series of programs would be considered by many as another weekly TV series and went on to become the highest rated TV show on television after the conclusion of Star Trek in 1967. Although a presidential debate was eventually scheduled two weeks before the election, James Dean instead invited opponent Richard Nixon to a track to race cars on the same night. Although reluctant at first, Nixon eventually agreed and went to spend the entire day with Dean, reportedly even telling the actor, to hell with it, I'm voting for you, you're already a better president than I'll ever be. This statement, although only a rumor, would spread like wildfire in tabloids and permanently curbed Nixon's chance for victory. On the morning of November 1st, 1968, four days before election day, Anti-Dean groups hijacked radio channels and told civilians they were fed up with James Dean and that television was ruining American youth. After the broadcast, the groups went on to cut hundreds of power lines in the southeast, effectively preventing any of Dean's presidential ads from reaching any household below Tennessee. Dean quickly heard of the incident and despite the risk of an assassination, flew down to the south and quickly went to work with local electricians to repair the broken power lines. James Dean would be met with a supportive crowd primarily younger voters who were eager to see a younger face back in the White House. Elderly white conservatives, often the parents of the younger supporters, remained in their houses and occasionally peered through their window blinds to catch a glimpse of the handsome candidate. Although it wasn't known to Dean at the time, hate groups in the South had perpetuated the idea that he was Satan in disguise and cited his good looks and his love for jazz as being clear signs of the devil. Of course, any super popular politician is going to have his or her detractors. But honestly, is anyone else getting like a weird vibe from James Dean? Like he seems too perfect a candidate, and we aren't being told something. And the general public seems to not really care. 
Then again, I could be just overreacting. We are also introduced to the ADA, the Anti-Dean Association, in this TV political ad right now. Elderly white conservatives in the Southeast would be the only demographic unfazed by his campaign. Yet Dean continued to travel from state to state, repairing power lines for four days straight until the very morning of the election. On November 5, 1968, James Dean received 75% of the popular vote with 395 electoral votes. Nixon congratulated Dean in a phone call the following morning. But Dean refused to acknowledge the win and instead asked to race cars again at the track. On January 20th, 1969, James Dean held his inaugural address at the official Capitol Raceway. Although presidents in the past had speeches that were typically around 20 minutes, Dean spoke for less than a minute. I have a speech. And it has the flotsam that you people expect to hear. But that's not fair. No, that's not fair at all. I'm here for all of you. It's only fair that you speak for yourselves. My words shouldn't be louder than yours. So I've brought many other guests to speak. They're just people like you and I. In the same time that many other presidents have spoken by themselves, America will speak. Thank you. Dean proceeded to introduce many groups to the microphone, including civil rights activists and Native American families. Martin Luther King Jr. would also come forward to speak in his first appearance since an attempt on his life nine months prior. President Dean would conclude the inauguration with a brief bongo performance and went on to race Richard Nixon at the track. In subsequent presidential inaugurations, those who disagreed with the elected president would instead celebrate Dean Democracy Day and protested by watching Dean's unique take on the address in place of the actual one. So some more historical changes have been made, such as MLK surviving his assassination and the 37th president of the United States becoming James Dean. But despite the crazed hysteria his popularity brought, it seems that the Anti-Dean Association created the term Dean Democracy to express this insane faith that the government was going to be perfect for the remainder of Dean's presidency. This is highlighted in the next section of our video. In a televised address, President Dean planned to inform Americans of his first 90 days in office. However, six seconds into the broadcast, the audio cut out and remained absent for the remainder of the speech. Although anti-Dean groups claimed responsibility and took pride in the sabotage, many civilians claimed that it benefited the president. The silent broadcast highlighted President Dean's sincere facial expressions and lively disposition, as opposed to the stern and stiff personalities of prior administrations. Viewers were proud to see a man in his prime at the most important position in the country. Ironically, President Dean's popularity grew after the technical difficulty, and film director Stanley Kubrick went on to call the broadcast the greatest silent film ever made. We can conclude that this is not our world, but at no point in this video did anyone mention the Alcatraz entity or the Liberty Looker. Surely they would be incredibly important topics for the general public to be worried about. Then again, it was the government who designed the Liberty Looker's statue, so maybe James Dean's presidency is just another project designed to distract the public from these monsters. This is Clyde Johnson, and I am the Pagan Valley's maintenance technician and nighttime security guard. 
To say I spend most of my time in this place is, well, an understatement. I was hired five years ago about Albert Carbine, and since I've always thought the man would die before selling this place, but after talking and meeting with him and the new owner, I almost shocked how different Carbine's acting around this new guy. Every time the owner goes into the office with us, Carbine turns white as a ghost. I saw that Laura's recording got put into the last video. What the hell does he want to do with these recordings? Marketing for theater? Cultivating mystic? Hell. Laura and I assumed the man was just getting inspired by some of the content he watches, but it's more than that now. Ever since he arrived, the theater feels wrong. Everyone feels like there's something breathing down our necks when trying to renovate the place, especially around the dressing room number three. Another employee and I were switching out the mirror on the wall when we heard the sound like a crying child. Again, in all my years in the theaters, believe me, I've never heard such a thing in my life. I suggested to the new owner that we set up some of the cameras at night. Despite all this horror shit he keeps putting into the videos, he said the only things haunting this theater were long ago memories. I offered to give him a tour when he was offering to buy this place, but refused. Only someone who has been here before can navigate the upstairs and basement like he has, I'm sure of it. I don't know who he is or where he has been, but he knew the valley, and he knew as well as I did. I feel like I'm talking to the void right now, so I'm going to end this recording here. Even though I sound worried, I'm somewhat excited for this fundraiser ball. I want to see if anyone from around the town recognizes him, because I want to know the truth. Alright, I'm off to the projector booth to work on the equipment in here. The owner wants to play a personal video for the ballroom with attendees as an example of future Pagan Valley productions. I'm going to set up those cameras near the dressing rooms anyway. Even if I don't find anything, it'll be good footage for the boss. Let's try to find out more in our next video, Washington Wormhole. This video begins with a poem about something called the special tree. Let's take a listen. The forest fell swiftly as the lumberjack swung, except for the special tree, which could not be stung. She missed her friends and the hymns they sung, so she started a tune that broke the man's lung. The video then switches to a timeline of events, zooming in on the earliest date of 1840, with a picture of a terrifying looking tree called the Special Tree. In 1848, it looks like the Washington Monument has begun construction with the Special Tree staying inside. The construction halts during the American Civil War, but prisoners of war are being led into the unfinished tower, which based on the Liberty Looker, can't be a good sign. In 1888, construction on the Washington Monument is completed. In 1910, the monument becomes a very popular tourist attraction, and included is a magazine ad, saying you can hear music in the walls, and at a price of 10 cents per head. We are then told between 1910 and 1971 that 20 people, including children, would disappear within the monument. In 1972, a classified video called Washington Standard Operation is leaked to the press. Let's take a look. So whatever this special tree is, is being fed victims intentionally by the government. But why? 
Why didn't they just leave the tree alone? And what could they possibly gain from it? Our video then cuts to the year 2000, when the monument is vandalized. Painted over the white bricks is the phrase, the infection is nigh, the music of Washington will soon end. Is this referring to the Alcatraz disease being spread? Or maybe this was the work of an anti-Dean associate who is still rebelling against the government. Our video then ends in 2003 with someone's home footage of the monument. Let's take a look. So the whole monument was bent over like a dying tree before the lightning struck between the circle of the tree the trunk created. Then we are told that all 19 victims went missing between 1910 to 1971 are still alive, just unconscious. But earlier the video told us 20 people were missing. So what happened to the last victim? Let's keep watching. Our next video is the longest in tonight's catalog, reaching at a whopping 18 minutes, and begins by showing us two documents, a recollection of the tragedy by John D. Rockefeller, and a child storybook called Virginia in Wonderland. The video then switches to John D. Rockefeller narrating his own memoir. Let's take a listen. The workers set up a Christmas tree just outside the entrance. It was an uncanny sight to see a green fir stand in the middle of what appeared to be a no-man's land. But this tree, humbly ordained with strings of cranberries, buttons, and tin cans, greatly affected me. It demonstrated that even in the darkest of times, the American people will light the beacons of hope. I thought it could be the start of a great an inspiring tradition, so I traveled north to Babylon in search of a Christmas tree for the following year. Our video then switches to a book written by a small child named Virginia. For 12 days and 12 nights, Mr. Rockefeller looked for the best tree in the forest. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? No, no, it's much too short. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? No, no, it's much too tall. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? No, no, it's much too average. Mr. Rockefeller soon feared that he would leave empty-handed. Then, on the twelfth night, just as he was packing up his stuff, Mr. Rockefeller heard the sweetest tune in the air. It sounded as though the very wind itself had fallen in love. He and his men followed the song and found themselves at the base of a very, very special tree. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? It's perfect. For the rest of the night, the men swung their axes at the special tree. Chop, chop, chop. However, when the sun rose, the tree was still standing. The axes had left no marks at all. Mr. Rockefeller was surprised. The next day, Mr. Rockefeller and his men laid 100 sticks of dynamite around the tree. Three, two, one, boom! Yet, the special tree continued to stand. Mr. Rockefeller was surprised. So Mr. Rockefeller decided to hire the best team of grave diggers to take the tree out of the ground. After a week of digging, they told Mr. Rockefeller, the tree will be out in three years at this rate. Mr. Rockefeller was surprised. 
that he decided to let the grave diggers work. He would pick the next three best trees for the next three Christmases. But by the fourth year, the special tree was ready to display. We've seen that tree before, the one Virginia has drawn. It's just like the tree that was put inside the Washington Monument. So the enormous Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center is another of one of these special trees. But Rockefeller didn't know it yet. Let's see what he has to say now. Taken offense at my silence, claiming it to be the result of a desensitization to workplace accidents. Indeed, I have seen enough accidents in three lifetimes. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened at the center. For some time now, my friends have blamed the center's original construction workers for the tragedy, since it was their very own Christmas tree that had started the whole tradition. But the truth is that their tree brought joy and wonder to the public. It was my tree, and my tree alone, that brought about the unprecedented loss. And since Virginia was there when Rockefeller set the tree up, let's see what she knows about what happened that night. On a cold December morning in midtown Manhattan, Rockefeller's men slowly raised the special tree. Heave ho! Heave ho! Heave ho! By the afternoon, the special tree was tall and still. It was unlike any other tree, having no color, branches, or leaves. The mayor of New York, Mr. Guardia, thought that the tree was too bare and asked for branches to be added so that ornaments could be hung. Mr. Rockefeller didn't agree. He thought the tree was perfect, just the way it was. But since Mayor Guardia had been one of his best friends, Mr. Rockefeller told his men to glue some branches on. I, Virginia, watched as the men placed branches on the special tree. I had saved my money for over nine months to purchase a little star ornament because I wanted to be the very first person to decorate the Rockefeller Christmas tree. It laid in my pocket while I watched because I planned to hang my ornament as soon as the tree was standing. After the final branch had been added and all the men left, I quickly ran up to the tree. But to my astonishment, the lowest branch of the tree was over twice my height. I jumped as high as I could, but still, the lowest branch was out of my reach. I was very disappointed. I wanted to be the very first person to decorate the tree, but now I had no chance. Unless, unless I called my friends. At once, I began counting my friends on my fingers. There was Helen, Charles, Elizabeth, Alice, Joseph, Elsie, Orville, Edith, Olive, and Philip. Ten! Ten friends that I could ask for help. Then I realized that ten friends standing on each other's shoulders could put me at the very top of the Christmas tree. My star could be the first and the tallest. Without a second to spare, I ran from door to door asking for help. Knock, knock, knock. Helen, are you there? Knock, knock, knock. Charles, are you there? Knock, knock, knock. Elizabeth, are you there? Eventually, I gathered all ten of my friends at the bottom of the Rockefeller Christmas tree. I told them my plan, to have them all stand on each other and form a ladder for me to climb to the top. My friends understood my excitement, and they quickly started to climb onto each other's shoulders. Ow! Helen had stepped on Charles' fingers. Ow! Charles had stepped on Elizabeth's fingers. Ow! Elizabeth had stepped on Alice's fingers. After many groans and tumbles, my friends formed a sturdy ladder, and I began to climb. My joy grew with every passing face. Before I knew it, I was at the very top, looking down at the tree. My ladder of friends swayed back and forth, and occasionally felt like it was about to collapse but I tuned out the movement and focused on the tree. Closer, friends, closer. Then I secured the metal star at the top of the tree. 
It was perfect. Hooray! Victory! I'm the first! Just then, there was a strange sound. The tree began to shake. Its glued branches fell off all at once, and the entire tree slowly bent backwards. Soon, the very top of it touched the ground, forming a perfect arc. It was like a very strange rainbow. My heart sank as I saw my star gently slide to the ground from the tree's top. Bolts of lightning then shot out from inside the arc of the tree, producing thunderous booms. The lightning scared my friends and me. We all tumbled to the ground and ran in all directions, but the lightning caught up to us. I was blinded by a great white light. I remember when my eyes adjusted, I was in a field of special trees, and, and I saw... Catch that? The video tried to redact it from Virginia's story, but someone in this wonderland she was in told her that the trees aren't. Let's keep listening. In a flash, I returned to the street where my friends and I had been struck by the lightning. We were all on the ground, being attended to by other people. I had scratched my legs badly, and I could see that my friends were also hurt. I looked up at the Rockefeller buildings, and I thought that they looked a little different. The whole street looked a little different, and the special tree was nowhere in sight. So Virginia and her friends witnessed the special tree bend backwards, which somehow transported her through another world just to wind back up into our world again. Let's see what Rockefeller has to say about this. It is only natural for the reader at this point to wonder why the incident has been referred to as a tragedy. There had been no loss of life, and aside from a few temporary scorch marks on the center, no damage to the surrounding property. I too assumed it was a mostly inconsequential event, likely an electrical accident whose effects were exaggerated by the children at the scene. I was grateful that every life involved had been spared. A death at the center would have weighed heavily on my mind for some time. But when I encountered the results of the children's medical examinations, I wished that a death had occurred in place of the unfathom. So is Rockefeller lying? There must have been casualties, and it definitely wasn't because of an electrical fire either. Let's see what happened to Virginia after this event. My mom and pa visited me at the hospital, but they looked completely different. Ma looked worried. After she wiped her tears, she asked, Did you hang your bear at the Rockefeller tree? I answered, It wasn't a bear. I was going to hang a star. To which they asked, what do you mean? Pa asked, where did you get these clothes? I answered, these are my clothes, the ones you helped me put on this morning. To which they asked, what do you mean? My ma then asked, where are there dots all over your face? I answered, they were my freckles. I've had them since I was little. To which they asked, what do you mean? My parents quietly left my bed and talked to my friend's parents. Then they all started to cry and yell. The nurses made them leave, which made me feel better. None of us thought that our real parents had visited, but they all did feel familiar. Orville and Philip were especially shaken. They didn't even share the same last name with their parents. The nurses tried to convince us that those who had visited us were our parents, and that we would come around to properly greet them after we healed. But it was hard to believe. Whenever I looked out the window, I saw that Manhattan looked different from memory. Mr. Rockefeller himself was kind enough to visit us in the hospital. He asked us whether we were okay, and then after some time, he and the nurses began to ask us some very easy questions about American history. With every reply, they would chuckle and shake their heads, until I told Mr. Rockefeller who I thought he was. He chuckled at first, 
and then became silent, as if the simple fact had deeply affected him. He had asked all my friends a few more questions about himself, and with each answer, he seemed a little more scared. Mr. Rockefeller quietly stood with the nurses for a while before he wished us a Merry Christmas and left. That evening, the nurses took x-rays of us to make sure we hadn't broken our ribs. Usually, those taking the x-rays are more than happy to show their patients what the pictures look like. But when I asked to see them, the nurses ignored me. I didn't fall asleep that night. I kept my ear close to the wall to hear what the nurses were saying next door. I heard one sentence over and over. Everything's backwards. I wonder what they meant by that. I never told my friends because I didn't want to scare them. But I spent the rest of the night with my hand to my chest, wondering if my heart was ever on the right side. So that's why Rockefeller doesn't understand what has happened in this memoir. Virginia and Rockefeller are not from the same reality. Virginia was transported to Rockefeller's where not even her parents are the same people, and she looks different to them. Let's see how Rockefeller reacted to this discovery. For several weeks, the children were kept under observation at the Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. I visited them as soon as I had the chance to. All the families of these children were deeply unsettled, for they had all independently come to the conclusion their child had been replaced by a doppelganger. They claimed that these new sons and daughters possessed substantial differences from their real children. The majority of differences involved altered physical attributes and the inability to recognize familiar locations and characters, such as their parents and their homes. Two boys even claimed to have names different to those that their mothers had given them at birth. But of all the discrepancies, the most bizarre was their faulty recollections of notable persons and events. For instance, each of the affected children claimed that I had become the wealthiest man in America through an oil monopoly. It is common knowledge that I did indeed work at an oil refinery in my youth, but to entirely deny my two terms as president and insist instead that I had always been a mere philanthropist struck me as being particularly odd. The families were agonized by the children's behavior. Some continued to search for their real children. I support their endeavors, for I do not believe that the children's afflictions were the result of hysteria. Every day, I find myself recollecting the day that I had selected the tree. I have since realized the difficulties involved in the removal of it should have repeatedly discouraged me. And had I been discouraged, the families of those children would not be experiencing the anguish that they currently have. Perhaps I never had the opportunity to select another tree. Perhaps I was meant to select that tree regardless of my persistent character. Perhaps we are all trolleys, forced to follow the path of the track to each of our destinations. I take solace in that thought. Or perhaps the tree chose me. So in both realities, Rockefeller moved the special tree to the Rockefeller Center. But in this alternate reality, Rockefeller was known for becoming president of the United States, not for being an oil tycoon. 
So is this the alternate reality that Virginia fell into, the same as the one James Dean became president? And what even are these trees that are capable of this? Our video then cuts to a statement made by Rockefeller's son about the special tree. Many, including my father, believe that the 1934 Christmas tree vanished. This is untrue. I have seen it wandering in the plaza on many occasions, and it resembles a man far more than a tree. We are then shown more handheld footage from somewhere between the 80s and the 2000s. So the special tree isn't a tree anymore, and it's been roaming around Manhattan for nearly a century at this point. With this video at an end, we've learned a lot about what these special trees are and what they are capable of. However, this doesn't explain why in the James Dean alternate reality, the government is intentionally aiding these entities with human lives. However, in this strange reality, it seemed that some presidents such as Rockefeller were never told the dangers of these trees, considering the first discovered one was in 1840. But also don't forget about Virginia, because her story is not yet over with. And I believe that is the perfect place to leave all of you with a cliffhanger. We are slowly putting together this mystery of the special trees, but what I want to know is if there's a connection between these trees and the government. After all, we saw the Liberty Looker and the Washington Monument actually attack people, and I doubt the government would allow such a thing to happen. Maybe under this new presidency of James Dean, things will be a lot different. But I'm going to end this analysis here for now, so be sure to stay tuned for part 2 which I plan to get started on immediately after this one gets uploaded. And remember to leave a comment down below after you like this video and subscribe to the channel. With that, this has been Pagan Valley, and I'll see you all in the next one.